thank you for joining the conversation. Um, my name is Minister Christian S. Watkins, and we have Rosalia, uh, Reverend Rosalia Johnson from Grace uh, United Methodist Church in Arlington, in Arlington, uh, uh, Texas. I was going to say Arlington, Alexandria. Lord have mercy. I mean Arlington, Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have uh, Reverend Dr. Holly Miller, who is uh, both Rosalia and I's um, ex uh, spiritual formation professor at Perkins School of Theology, and she's now at Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer University um, uh, doing spiritual formation and guidance work there, amongst a whole bunch of other glorious things, um, call, uh, lifting up the the Christian community in this uh, in this world that we live in. And I'm grateful for them for. Um, for being part of this conversation, for leading us in the ways in which we can navigate spiritually and uh, and and in Christian life, in Christ life, through these dark times that we're living in. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and uh, continue the conversation. Rosalia, can you pray for us one more time, and then uh, we'll go from there. Let us go to God, and as we go to God. Um, Let's just breathe in the spirit of God and breathe out anything that is toxic, anything that you've heard or seen, any response that you've gotten that may have not been um, encouraging. And so we breathe in the Holy Spirit and we breathe out anything that is toxic, anything that is not like God. So let us go to God in prayer and let us just pause for a moment before going into prayer. Gracious God, we come to you just praising you and adoring you for who you are. You are our rock, you are our deliverer, you are a protector, you are a provider, you make a way out of no way, and you are good. God, we are grateful for who you are in our lives because that is our hope. Our hope is built on the foundation of your word, and we thank you for that. God, we come to you with humble hearts, we come to you asking that there is transformation. We come to you asking that there is understanding. We come to you asking that there be a greater awareness of living faithfully, of what it means to seek justice, of what it means to pursue peace the way that you would have us to do it. God, we ask that you prick and pierce the hearts of those who are not in alignment with your will for their lives and your will for the community. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for everyone that is on this call. I ask that you put a hedge of protection around them and bless them and their families. And God, we pray for those that have been killed. Those that have not gotten a chance to seek justice. But God, we also pray because you have called us to love you with everything that we are and to love our neighbors and our enemies as ourselves. So we don't only pray for those families that have lost loved ones and those that did not get to seek justice. We pray, God, for the hearts of those who are the perpetrators of police brutality, of racism, of discrimination, of social profiling, of anything that is not like you. God, we confess that we have not done everything right. So forgive us for the things that we have done and forgive us for the things that we have left undone. Make us better. Move us into action. Make us catalysts for the glory of your kingdom. And I pray this prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make us an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. 
Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Divine God, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. And it's in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it's in dying that we are born to eternal life. Help us die to ourselves. Help us die to ourselves. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. Well, Dr. Miller, Wage uh, uh, Sages Council, how do we navigate the history of racism, the ongoing effects of racism? The systemic effects of racism spiritually and as, and as followers of Christ. How do we how do we do that? Go ahead and take us take us from here. It is an honor to be with you, Minister Christian Watkins, Reverend Rosolia Johnson. You are gifts in your leadership and hosting. And as we talked and met about this time, it's also important that as questions um, come up. Uh, in the chat that we are responding to you. If you have a particular question for one of us or all of us, um, please feel free to place it in the chat room and discussion and I'll work at pausing points. And also because um, Christian and Rosolia um, are working at the hosting today, they will also interrupt or ask questions as well. So it is, so good to be with you today. Um, know that as I'm coming here today, um, I spoke very clearly in response um, when I, I was asked to do the solo panelist to say I'm a white woman. <laughs> how, how can me as a white woman, while I can work at being informed as much as possible, we swim, I swim in the reality of racism in our cultural context. And why I choose that phrase is a fish usually doesn't realize that they're even swimming in water and um, <laughs> that, that we're so unaware of that. And um, I too, as a white woman, am still increasing my awareness in the reality of being steeped in a culture that is suffering from the sin of racism and in a church suffering from the sin of racism. And so know that I had these deep questions to be one on um, one with you in this and uh, received powerful and beautiful responses and support. But more than that, I want to let you know that I am still in recovery and I will be for the rest of my life. Um, I'm going to acknowledge that um, I'm in places of power with a PhD within the church. As a white woman, I have inherited power by the nature of the color of my skin. There are many areas that I can blend in. And so when I listen deeply, which is requiring listening again and again and for the rest of my life, and hear the depth of tiredness and horror and sadness and trauma, what happens for me is the sense of I can sometimes escape by the very nature of blending in and use that as an escape route or keeping the status quo. So I am responsible for that. And I'm going to ask us to be responsible and I'm going to give us particular practices, spiritual practices in the midst of trauma and navigating that and how to begin to engage systematically in the church and in the community. Dr. Miller, it, it, thank you for that admission and for verbalizing your, your process in short of how you've become, how you've gotten to where you are. What do you, before you go into what you just explained, why do you need, or why should white people own the process, right? Mm -hmm. Go a little bit deeper into that. Yeah. 
Well, I'm going to start with um, uh, the fact that we benefit from a system that is over 400 years old of enslaving our sisters and brothers um, here <laughs> and continued systems that are in operation and handed down over time. So we actually benefit from being white in our cultural context and are used to having places of power. Just look at the lineup of presidents if that doesn't um, begin to show you in terms of power. But every public policy, um, all is interconnected. If I had a web to show you and could lift up the web, it's all interconnected and it's wired for a sense in which what, what we call white privilege, um, meaning I don't have to, quite frankly, um, be accountable for my body, so to speak, in a space. That is a privilege as a white person. Now you may say, yes, you do. Yes, I do. <laughs> but, but the reality is, is I can blend in in a cultural context of power. I, I, as a mother, just on a very basic level, did not have to introduce my white son to how to negotiate with police officers when we're stopped, when he's stopped, in terms of his own bodily protection and keeping his hands on the wheel. My counterpart, mother, and I'll use Reverend Johnson right here, needs to do that. And therefore, I am in a privileged position in our society in terms of vulnerability and systemic oppression and laws. I was never defined as three-fifths of a person for the advantage of white people. I was never defined in my history as three-fifths of a person by our constitutional addendum structure, ever. That's privilege. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Now, how do we navigate it spiritually? <laughs> yeah. Can I, can I just say, I want to say this for people that are asking for understanding. You're saying that that is what you're doing. And I want to say, you know, in our meeting this morning, one of the things that I just want to share with everyone that's watching is one of the things that is so healing, supportive, encouraging, and empowering is for those in power to just say, I am here to listen. That in and of itself is powerful. I am here to listen. I want to listen. I want to hear what you have to say. And that is, I mean, so many people are like, I don't know what to say. I don't know, you know, um, you know, my friend and I were talking today and, they, and we, I told you guys last time when we walk in the neighborhood now, you know, everybody's extra friendly because they're afraid they, because they don't know where we're coming from. It's afraid on a different level you know, extra friendly. And so my friend, I said, well, what did they, you know, what would be appropriate for them to say? Would you say, how's everything going? Well, you know, <laughs> would I answer honestly how everything is going? You know, how are you doing? Is everything all right? You know, so what, what do you say? So I, I want to just encourage people who may not have reached out. And let me just say, for me, silence is consent. If I haven't heard from you and you're a friend of mine, I want to hear from you, even if it means you say, I don't know what to say, but I'm just checking on you. So I just wanted to throw that in. So we've already gleaned, and we're going to go deeper and deeper into that practice of listening, but we've already gleaned a specific practice. I am here to listen because there's something I need to learn, but also I'm just here to listen. I mean, Job's friend sat with him for three days straight without talking, and then they talked and they should have kept quiet and ended up leaving. But even Job's friends sat for three days right. <laughs> um, listening. So what would it be like, uh, I'm turning the tables here, but Minister Watkins, what would it be like if I, if I just said to you, I'm here to listen? You know, it, it, it would be a shock, 
Um, well, if I didn't know you, <laughs> um, it would be shocking. Um, it, it would be shocking in a way because I can't tell you how many times I've been outside of the United Methodist building with the sign up that says, I can't breathe, just standing out there, sitting out there, um, and have been passed by like I was invisible, um, only for them to take a couple more steps and take a picture of a sign, you know. So, and, and that is pervasive in community, how we walk past each other, orbit around each other without acknowledging anyone's, uh, anyone else's uh, existence, let alone take the time to hear from hear from someone genuine. So just hearing, just opening the uh, conversation or opening the door to conversation is, is a pretty tangible, valuable thing. Mm -hmm. So listening, how, what a gift. Um, and listening means pausing long enough in order to enter in. Uh, pausing long enough in order to truly hear. But the particularity of pain related to what is happening in the ongoing trauma that is happening right now, especially to our brown and black sisters and brothers our, and our daughters and sons, um, is so high, there's going to be a particularity to pain. So how I listen or am, and I use the word posture with people, the posture I take with people will need to be adapted based on the particularity of the person and what the person is encountering or, and the community they're connected to is encountering. So what will work in one place will not work somewhere else. And so to be aware that it's not, did I get it wrong? Did I get it right? It's more, we're going to learn from each other on the particularity of the piece of what works for that person. And that does require a deep listening to where the person is at. So the spiritual practice of listening begins the process. Um, I want to say my particular bent or approach that I'll be using or you're going to find today is my research work is on embodiment and looking at trauma and looking at how communities worship, particularly marginalized communities, and how we can learn from the embodiment of the um, overcomers in marginalized communities to further the church right now. And so this is my passion, my work, my love, and the particularity of spiritual practices within that. And usually spiritual practices tend to get taught as a one size fits all. And that's just not true. <laughs> one size does not fit all at all times. What way work in one context or one situation will work differently in another context or situation. But I wanna start uh, just the way I started today or we started is how do you arise? Um, usually when we think of spiritual practices or something that we practice, it's something that those people do over there and they're holy and therefore I'm not holy if I don't enter in. So we have a separation of this. Or the church is over here and the protests are over here. I totally disagree. It's the opposite of what is true. <laughs> um, Worship is our giving of allegiance. Spirituality is what drives the allegiance. What is the spirit of it? So worship is the giving of allegiance and spirituality is what drives that, the spirit of it, that life-giving pulse. And this movement has powerfully erupted amidst Pentecost. And I talked last time in terms of what it means to be a breath giver and not a breath taker, what it means to be a breath giver with the spirit of God. And so we, um, where I started was to ask people how they, we, we arrived. And that may seem so basic. It's something I do in my classes. It's something I do with groups. It's something I do in other contexts because people arrive in very different ways, even to respond to the question we pause and listen to what's embodily going on, starting in ourselves. 
and we're expressing that. And I usually give people an opening like I did. Do you arrive incensed or angry? Because that's okay too. Because even as we gather together in the church, in small groups, in context, usually we're not given permission to hold the array of what's really going on. It's not included. In fact, I've encountered, uh, had a student share with me that the goal of the church was to, we hope that you arrive feeling, you leave feeling good about yourselves. That was the whole goal of the church service. Now think of that in contrast with Jesus in the gospels. And I mean, my husband spoke this last week at, at the church on, um, the, I brought the sword to divide and it, it's like, oh my word. Now, how does that sound? It's just not going to be a gospel that works out for, we hope y'all feel better when you go. Um, <laughs> but there's no permission to really be where we are. So notice if we are representatives of Christ as Christians, as believers, we hold the power to give people permission to be angry. Anger is not in opposition to God. There is a righteous anger that is really, really, really crucial to turning the tables of what's going on. And so I will open a worship gathering sometimes or a group sometimes, something like this. And I'm just going to illustrate it so you can actually see and use this tool and adapt it. Um, and that is, in the name of the Holy Spirit who comes among us, welcome. For those who are anticipating, welcome. For those who are thankful, welcome. For those of us who are angry, welcome. For you who are tired, welcome. For you who can hardly hold back the tears that have been your food day and night, welcome. God welcomes all. And we gather in the name of the one who welcomes us together. So already in that practice, I'm not sure what it was like for you to be welcomed in that way, but there is permission for wherever you are at to be drawn into the presence of God, which means that we are representing an image of God as well, which is that God holds the depth and the breadth and the width and the height of what is going on. And we need to embody that reality and allow for practices. So I'm gonna just do a pause there because I've just started in just this brief snapshot of what we're holding and what, how we draw people into a spiritual practice. That is a spiritual practice of welcome, of prayer, and of illustrating who God is in community and how people are. So notice all those layers going on at the same time in one spiritual practice. But you can ask in a group how people arrive, and then you can use the words of the group to welcome. I'm going to pause there just for a moment. If there's anything that you have to ask, but I'm going to keep going, but I'm going to pause there. You know, I saw a um, post earlier today from a young lady um, on Instagram, <clears throat> and she was uh, trying to break down that us versus them mentality that's happening right now. Like it's a war between the anti-racists and, and the racists. Like it's a war between black and white people. And, and I understand where she was going. I, I value the way that you just articulated it as well. It's not, a it's not a race between, it's not a war between people. It's a, it's a war between us, everybody, all, and the systems that were designed over years to, to disenfranchise others and to subjugate others and to categorize others, including black people, including women, including uh, the Hispanic community, Hispanic and Latino community, and the list goes on, the LGBT community. I mean, it's all mm -hmm. encompassing. All these, all, 
like I said earlier in a conversation that I had, we're all suffering from something. Right. And most likely that something is the, is the, is the ideal of whiteness, right? And Ooh. the resulting, and the resulting uh, manifestations of racism that have come along with that colonialism, capitalism, um, uh, all the is all the isms and phobias, that kind of thing. And we have a Christian duty, you know, to to pursue Christ in all these matters because we saw back in biblical antiquity how how people were divided, you know, those people, the 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 sinners and the and the tax collectors, the the Samar the Samaritans, the the even the Ethiopian eunuch in the New Testament who wasn't who wasn't supposed to be able to understand or read God's word. However, when we overcome our personal biases, right, and pursue Christ who pursued all, who per still pursues all, then we can have a, a good Christian mindset to, you know, traverse these issues. But that's just me. I'm not the professor here. I'm not the doctor. So <laughs> <laughs> No, but you did you have some real wisdom <laughs> for sure and astuteness and leadership. Yes, yes. And I'm going to name in the midst of that, there is a particularity in the sin of racism that why now, what's the impact? It's been happening all along. It's just videoed now. But if you, if we really ponder this um, in working with embodiment, it's, I think it's no accident that it's right now, uh, that it is coming. It's really moving uh, right now. Uh, being in the midst of a pandemic and in the midst of the epidemic of racism that has been long seeded in, in our, in, in our water, um, so to speak. And it really is in our water. If you, uh, well, I'm going to use that as an illustration in a minute, but um, if we look at that, something my husband said the other day when I talked about this is that we've been sheltering in place, but our brown and black sisters and brothers have been sheltering in place for a very, very long time because their own bodies, their own skin color has had to shelter in place all their lives. This is why listening becomes so crucial because any, that truly any, brown or black sibling <laughs> in faith or otherwise has a story of racism directed at the particularity of them as an individual person and as a people. And as a white person, I guarantee you have been around people making racist jokes and comments. I have. I have. And you've been around places where people have not been welcomed because of the color of their skin. I mean, I'll bet you anything that the white people, including myself in this call, could make a list of places that it would not be as comfortable for people with brown or black skin to be who are your friends. And it is not something that we can sanitize. So when this showing of George Floyd being murdered before our very eyes with a knee to his neck. Pro-life was no longer only in the womb, it's out of the womb too. And so when people use the argument about pro-life with you and don't you care about abortion, say very clearly that pro-life needs to be accountable for outside the womb as well. And this is an outside the womb pro-life reality. <laughs> and when there is a knee to a man's neck and we are watching him die, just like I'm going to say Reverend Johnson said earlier, how many videos have we not seen? How many people have we not seen? This is an epidemic that is very real and we have a pandemic going on inside the epidemic and it's been embodied. And when we talk about being a nobody, nobody, Having no body, in other words, you are a nobody. I mean, you just talked about that, uh, Minister Watkins, at the sign. And it's just, you're part of, either you're ignored or looked askance at um, and suspiciously. And it's embedded in our bodies. 
racism is embedded in our bodies. It, it gets embedded in our bodies. I used the illustration last time, mom on elevator with white mom on elevator with baby and a black man gets on elevator. She holds baby tighter. Two year old now on elevator tighter. Four year old, five year old, six year old, seven year old, how long? I also, um, at a previous institution I worked at that um, both Rizzoli and Christian are very familiar with, every single one of my colleagues had been stopped in that area for driving while black. Every single one of them. There we go. And students. And I was needing to listen very clearly in teaching a spiritual formation class when a student went from being on a panel with prospective students and the board of trustees at the school to represent students. And he was followed and then he was laid out on his car as soon as he got home to his apartment. And the next day, he needed a place to rage and he needed permission. I have never had that experience. Not once. You, so, yeah. Can I, I was just gonna, can, oh. <laughs> I was We're gonna both like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> let me say something, Christian. Okay, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Go ahead, Christian. I was, well, um, I've had this reflection since all of this started. Um, and being black in America is akin to living, is perpetual, is akin to perpetually living Good Friday with no goodness in sight other than the promise that never realizes, mm -hmm. that never comes to realization. So with this, with all the protests happening around Pentecost, as Alphanetta uh, Alpha said, Al as you said earlier, and as Alphanetta mentioned in the uh, comments, it, it, it's not lost on me that God's hand is moving through all of this. But can we see it? Mm -hmm. can, we, can we hold on to that hope? And can we participate in the in the in the in our own liberation? Mm. So, <laughs> and, and I I was gonna just say you know when we talked about that earlier one of the things that I thought about afterwards is that um, you know not only are we because I I got stopped probably once a week, mm. and I was asked whose whose car was I driving and do I sell drugs. Jesus. <laughs> but, but, uh, and so, and so I think our stories, you know, one of two things, so our, our stories are number one, edited out, you know, that's one thing it's edited out, or there's this stereotype that's created for us. And that is the story. This is a black person driving this, or this is a black person driving here, or just this is a black person and we're punished for that. Um, I think Reverend Dr. Miller, one of the things that I, I said this morning was that, you know, we're tired. We're tired of being punished just for being black. We're tired of having our stories edited out. Um, the contributions that we've made, the neighborhoods that have been completely, not just Tulsa, but right here, right in Denton, Texas. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, I know New York is Seneca Village and Denton, if you have never heard of it, let me look. Um, it is... Yeah, New York's... Um, New York's... Um, uh, New York Central Park. Used to be a black... Yes. Used to be a black neighborhood, Seneca Village. And in Denton, Texas, it used to be called Quaker Town. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, and so we're edited out or, you know, they just came in and took things away and, and people are tired. I sent, a, I sent Dr. Miller and Minister Watkins a video today that kind of explains, and I'll, I'll post that in our resources and it has some language in it, I'm gonna warn you. But if you're trying to understand where different people are coming from because I know that you know people group all all people together so the looters the rioters and the protesters are all being grouped into the, the angry mob you know and it's not it's not that is not how it how it is and there they have when I post that resource then you'll see kind of what their frame of mind is um but I just 
our, our stories have been edited out for too long. And so what happens is you either have people who um, try to figure out how to work with other people to make things better for transformation, or you have people who are angry and want to create their own system. So with all this fatigue, so with all the fatigue that black people are having, uh, that black people have, and with all the fatigue that comes along with unraveling one's own personal history of racism or their involvement in it or their complicitness in it, um, with all of the just with with all the exhaustion that comes along with being in a pandemic and witnessing history uh, transform in our in our midst, um, how do we navigate that and successfully become more Christ-like in it? So I shared this quote last time too, which was uh, from Thomas Troger. How do we encounter the bodily weight of truth? So right, a floodgate of trauma that many people have had to press down all their lives to survive and, and keep going um, came tumbling forth in that moment because it was not only that George Floyd was killed. It was that there's a living death going on and death sentences. And so first of all and foremost, it is validating that this is extraordinarily traumatizing and it keeps going and acknowledging that this is really happening because it's making a crazy or really harmful when we lack the ability to empathize with the bodily weight of truth of the reality of what's going on and the horror of it, the ongoing horror and traumatization. There is only so much saturation point, but then it happens again and again. And just in a very bodily how we function is we function in trauma differently. When a crisis occurs, we move into a fight or flight. When, and, and for white people often, not all, but for white people often, we are able to recede and the fight or flight moves back. And then our governing of our frontal lobe is able to come back and we can function and so on. That's not to say that white people don't suffer from PTSD, but what I'm saying is, is that there's a movement that we get to move out of fight or flight and move into where our frontal lobe instead of our base lobe um, or reptilian brain functions, just bodily. When our very bodies become the, the field in which that is oppressed, our very bodies become the place that is oppressed, then that fight or flight is not allowed to fully settle. And so the trauma and the re-traumatization and the awareness that just take a chill, just take a chill pill. I mean, after all, it was, I didn't do that. So validating and holding space for the validating while the others going on to say, hey, just a minute. Let's start by just listening to this. Let's start by listening to it. So, so holding that space and using power to do that in order that the bodily weight of that can start to be heard and have permission. And, and, and setting up the frameworks that that can happen in the church. We need to set up frameworks. And so whites have a lot of work to do, and we keep saying that, but I'm going to share with you some tools for that in a moment, some further tools for that uh, in terms of spiritual practices. But right now, when we are bone tired and the fight or flight is in front of us at night, and during the day and in our very skin and we're not able to rest. What spiritual practice do we turn to? How, where do we turn? What spiritual practice in trauma? The first step in fight or flight in trauma 
in an intensive, in a moment, and even in yourself, know that you are encountering, quick, take stock of your body. And if all else fails, touch your hands together. It's grounding yourself again incarnate. So incarnation matters. Placing yourself back in a body when you have been declared, I'm trying to find a contrasting and a uh, word for this, but it's, it's, it's worse than being a no body. It's that, it's the sense in which, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say a racist comment that I was told, which was, um, I really wanted Jesse Jackson to become president <laughs> when I was in high school. And I happened to live in Iowa at the time we were moving around because my parents were ministers. And so I caucused for him. And one of my white friends said, we wouldn't want him to be president because what if blacks end up enslaving whites as revenge? Welcome to white privilege and try, you notice the narrative there, which we're gonna get to in a moment. But notice that bodily weight of that. But when we're bone tired, Take stock and use your hands because incarnation matters. And when people say, I wasn't responsible for that many years ago that happened in slavery, I'm not enslaving anybody after all. Finally, I'm calling all of us in the midst of that we have an incarnational core to our faith in Christianity. We claim Christ as central to Christianity. In fact, the new people out of the sect of Judaism were turning the world upside down in the book of Acts. And so Re-entry into the body matters, and the body matters, and the body matters. And if we're holding that we are a follower of Jesus Christ, we don't get permission to ignore history. Because God entered history over 2,000 years ago, <laughs> and we hold it as central in our tradition. And so if we think that the sin of racism is somehow done, I'm going to use um, Zan Holmes phrase um, because <laughs> my husband shares it with me often, which is you need to blame it on Jesus people because it's right there in the gospel and in Christianity that we're centrally incarnate. And so we can't get around the history of slavery because we're going to have to enter right into the pain because Jesus entered right into over 2000 years ago. So whether it's 500 years, 400 years, 300 or 200 or 100, it doesn't matter people. As Christians, we are incarnational. That is the kind of preaching, the teaching, the care and the love and the entry that we need and prophetic witness that we need. And you, you will be empowered to know entry points in your context to name that. So be very aware and awakened to that. But I'm acknowledging something in the midst of being bone tired incarnating notice your hands when you wash your hands take your time when you march stomp your feet and when i say stomp your feet that kind of stuff and racism has to be shaken out it goes through the body trauma work often helps us locate where in our bodies does it hurt and i mentioned ruby sales last time we need to be with a community. And if you are not in any community that can do this, you need to help create one, <laughs> whether it's two, three, or four people. What community are you in where you can encounter the bodily weight of truth together and become truth tellers with one another of what's really going on in your body? Because the body right now in our communities and the body of Christ is saying there is something really wrong. And so are you in the chat. That's what's so powerful. You know bodily, you know bodily that something's wrong. And the body knows before the mind is able to communicate it. Our body leads the way. 
And so I used the illustration of the woman with, he with the hemorrhage last time to help lead us in. And I'm gonna say again, that part of the work of being boned tired is really strong in this woman with the hemorrhage for 14 years in the story that we encounter her. And we have sanitized her story. We even call an issue of blood using a sanitary napkin. We are so good at sanitizing her story. And her story is a healing for the whole community. It's not a healing for her. In fact, she's the hero of the story. I mean, Jesus is central to it because Jesus makes her story, and we're going to, we can unpack that a little bit. But just as soon as we think, well, isn't it just between me and God? This is actually a community thing. My husband uh, poured me so lovingly a glass of water. Now I can pretend that I can do it all on my own in our society, but as soon as I pick up this water, this water is a reminder that somebody has cleaned the water for me and enabled it to get to my house and hooked it up and there's a system of checks and balances in our society for this water that I get to drink. I am linked to a system of regulation when I drink this water. I am linked to the providers, including at the wastewater treatment plant, who get me clean water. My, my brother did work for the sewage company one summer. He was kind of stinky every day when he got home, but wastewater treatment plants are really helpful. Um, and, and whether the water is clean or not in my particular area. I am already interconnected with my community. And we could just look at half the people in today's call, this water will no longer be available for half of the world within 50 years. And let's not forget the environmental um, issues that have happened and the systemic issues that have happened that have enabled um, Flint, Michigan, um, that have that the poison water in Flint, Michigan, that have enabled the um, uh, certain levels of certain toxicities in the water to exist without consequence, like in uh, southern Dallas and in other areas of the country. I mean, so these, so your, your, I like your analogy of the clean water, and then we also have to hold into hold in 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 uh, in, in context with that the issues the systemic issues that keep us poisoned. Yes. Yes. And I was exactly going to, I'm so glad you shared that because systemically who gets access to this clean water and who doesn't. And if you don't think that's a very real thing, go to the Middle East to an olive grove where the, all the water has gone to another location except that olive grove. And that's, they can tell, they can tell you that, where they own that land since the Ottoman Empire. So our imaginations are, are in a real struggle. We're in a real vacuum in the in, in North America context. In the Middle East, the imagine our imaginations are in decades. In Europe, centuries, and in the Middle East, imaginations are in millennia. So it's also a problem of how we view history. I mean that's but in terms of water, I'm gonna even complicate matters further. If you give a man a fish, you know the phrase? Then he'll just have a fish for the day. But if you teach a man to fish, he will be able to fish for a lifetime. What if somebody else has fished all the fish out of the pond? What if the pond's contaminated? What if there's a quota of who gets to fish at the pond at what period of time? What if that man has a certain skin color that prohibits him from using that particular pond? What if the system is set up so that actually he's at work and can't afford, and the times that he's allowed to go to the pond, he can't get off from work? This starts to complicate things. So our, just a cup of water shows how interrelated we are. Yes, yes. Thank you, Kay, for that resource. Mm -hmm. So these are all components 
to our very being in our body and how do we re-enter our body? So with trauma, we need place, trauma's fragment. And in a living death that is continuing to occur, there's a continued fragmentation. And at the core, we need acts of remembering, remembering, re-membering, putting back together what was never meant to be fragmented. And this is where we as followers of Jesus Christ have an act, part of an act of worship is the being and the doing of remembering, putting back together what was never meant to be separated. So the spiritual practice of allowing what's really going on to be brought into the worship context instead of outside of the context is crucial. Naming what's going on, naming names of what's going on, naming people of what's going on and what's happening to people, saying a name. In baptism, we give people, we say, what, na what name have you? What are you, who are, what are you naming? This is very sacred. But if we do not say the name, if we ignore the names, then we're missing something. The other is get used to being messy and have the gospel get messier. Tell people what you're wrestling with. Ask people to wrestle with texts and questions. Don't tie a bow on it. I said this before and I say it to students again and again. Do not tie a bow on somebody's experience. Because now I'm re-traumatizing the very thing which only increases the exhaustion. Yeah. I I'm going to pause there. I wanted to ask you because the re-traumatizing, you know, trying to put a bow on it. I was going to ask you, how do we, how do we, there's a question on here and I, Christian, I think you caught that from Allison. There's a question, but you know, I was talking before and I'm with my friends and we said, how do we get, you know, this is, and someone else said, this is, a movement and not a moment and they have a different question but mine is you know there are these things that people do to have these feel-good moments as you know pastors and spiritual leaders they want this kumbaya moment you know where where it's kind of like a photo op <laughs> you know mm -hmm. look at us we're all together you know we're we're peaceful you know we have black white, brown, we have all people together. We have this kumbaya ya moment. But like you said, the, the gospel is about more than that. It, it's, it's more than a kumbaya moment. So how do we help without offending those people that are doing those things? You know, they've done their, you know, cute little service that says, you know, we shall overcome and then that's it. So how do we help people to understand that it's not just a kumbaya moment that we, that we want and need and that in doing that and then doing nothing else does re-traumatize because you have, you have people getting their hopes up because we feel like you're interested in right. not this moment, but the movement. And right. then there's nothing else, but you have your photo op, you know, you've had your kumbaya moment. You're able to say, look at this picture. You know, we, there, were all, there were all races, all colors of people at this, and we did this. Right, right. But now what? <laughs> right, right. And, my, and, and then my second question is, with the re-traumatizing, two things. How do we as Christians continue to bless while we bleed? Ooh. Well, I just want the weight of that to settle in because that was a very strong statement. Both of those were profound. So there is no one size fits all in the first one. Every context is gonna be really different. And so whenever I work with a group or uh, a cluster or anything, I learn the stories, the context very, very keenly because What's being done there is a holding up of a, of a story that is not the gospel. <laughs> it, is, it is a 
at the best, a surface gospel that isn't really the true good news because it is not good news in the long haul. And it will not hold weight when people suffer. I don't care who it is. It will not hold its weight. So the question becomes, one, do you need to enter that context or not? And especially those who are traumatized. If your call is that, yes, you do, then at that point, it's time to either introduce some stories or have a white person come along in. Um, so um, to come in and help the white people do their work, have people in power do their work, because asking where it hurts, being open to do that is a long, long work but it's holding up a mirror to what's really going on, which is, and then creating the space where simply people can be heard because there's a lot of space where that cannot happen and it serves only to re-injure and it is exploitative. And that's an exploitative act that you just described. So I'm gonna name that clear, clear as can be. And it's the turning of the tables that need to happen. And so context is going to be crucial. And then the second one, how do you bless and bleed? You, you already do. Because you are. I'm just going to name and validate that. But one, this power of agency in trauma is one of the greatest gifts that we have to navigate through trauma is when the agency to bless is put back in your hands when cursing spit racial slurs both the power to shake the dust off your feet and the power to bless and bleed, these actions are the actions of Christ. Speaking of incarnation. Yes, Christian. Other questions? Yeah. Thank well, you. Thank you. For thank that. you. Thank yeah. you for both of those. For both of those explanations. I mean, I, it, it's... We... I, I, I can feel where Brazilia was coming from because while we're being you know, afflicted on every side, right? We're, we're constantly wounded, right? And we don't want to bleed all over people and, and get things messy and, and cause others to be infected with our own issues, that kind of thing. However, there is a way, like you just, like you just let us through, a way to be a blessing while we're bleeding, right? So we have three questions that I want to uh, bring those persons on live uh, to be able to ask their questions. Um, the first one I want to go to is Carmen Alexander, and let's see if uh, we can work this out. Let's, let's see. Carmen, Ooh. are you with us? You can unmute yourself. I am here. Hello. Where, where are you from? I'm hailing from Lake Wiley, South Carolina, which is actually the suburbs of Charlotte. Nice. And I am, I've been honored and privileged to be uh, Dr. Miller's student this semester in spiritual formation. Awesome. Glad to have you, Carmen. It's great to be here. So what's your question? So my question is, um, I have a unique situation. Um, I am African American. My husband is Caucasian. Uh, he is a pastor of the United Methodist Church here in Lake Wiley, South Carolina. And I am the only woman of color. I'm the only person of color besides our uh, three sons and our biracial daughter. Um, what I am noticing is that um, there's been no um, acknowledgement or nothing has been expressed or talked about in regards to all that's been going on. It's like there's this huge uh, elephant in the room, as they say, and um, all of the church members seem to walk around me, uh, give me that, um, just the standard basic talk 
with no real engagement. Um, we are here in South Carolina where there is distinct racism. Um, and we're close to a city called Clover that a, they actually have the city basically divided between African Americans who living on one side of the track and Caucasian living on the other. Um, so my question is, is to me is that before the church can go out and minister to the community in regards to dealing with racism, when are we going to even just talk about racism within the church? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's difficult for me um, as being the, Afri the only woman of color um, and it places me in positions where I have to represent, or at least feel I have to represent, um, but there is no one that I can talk to or relate to or anything like that. Um, so it's an issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, I just don't, number one, I just want to do what God will have me to do in regards to racism in the church. Um, but it's just a difficult time. So, so again, the question is, how do we address racism in the church? And Minister Watkins and Reverend Johnson, I'm going to have you, I get to connect with the incredible conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and she gets to hear me. And so, and, and um, I will be there with her, but I want her to hear your voices on this one and what your thoughts are so she can hear you. My thank you for the, Sister uh, Alexander, thank you very much for the question. And, and, I, and, and I, I can empathize with where you are. Um, there's a couple of suggestions that I have, um, but I want to ask this question first. Within that worshiping community, you don't feel a part of it? Well, it's difficult to say, being that my husband is the pastor. <laughs> uh, but he knows that um, I'm struggling. Um, as uh, Reverend Johnson said, uh, I'm tired. Um, I've there's one church member that actually reached out to me and she knows um, she is concerned about me. Um, and one thing she did say, she said, this does need to be addressed, but it does not need to be addressed by you. Mm -hmm. um, and okay. so that was comforting. But um, so do I feel a part? Not really, not at this point, no. Okay, so you have two access points as far as the community is concerned to address this uh, issue. Well, you have a couple, a uh, couple others, but uh, that requires traveling the the hierarchy of the conference that you're in. However, um, specifically where you are, um, what comes to mind is that since your husband knows about the issue, and since a um, a fellow congregant has reached out to you, you have two open windows to travel through, to look through, to uh, to to go through in order to address this with the community. Um, if I mean, John Wesley set us up with the personal accountability uh, model of uh, uh, taking care of each other as well as questioning each other's uh, participation in um, uh, uh, social and personal uh, uh, holiness. You know, um, back in the day when the United Methodist Church was, uh, was being developed here in the United States, um, pastors would travel circuits, you know, to preach on Sunday. However, it was those classes and societies that were set up as churches and as groups, ministries within the churches that held each other accountable. So you'd have societies of, of, of men, women, children, all kinds of different uh, uh, affinity groups within the church um, that held each other accountable. And they could not take communion until they answered in the affirmative that they were working towards you know, that, per, that, that communal and, and personal piety, that personal holiness. And I think that's one of the traditions of the church that we've lost is that we haven't, we don't hold each other accountable. Pastors just say, um, be healed or, or whatever the ritual is to, um, to administer the sacraments, but we don't check in to see if everybody's participating in, in our communal liberation. So this might be an opportunity for you to go back to the friend that, to reach out to the sister that, uh, that reached out to you and have this conversation, have it on a deeper level, 
um, to establish a relationship, a friendship with her, you know, and then talk to somebody else that kind of feels the same way, but hasn't, hasn't gained the fortitude to ask you about it, maybe, and start the conversation that way. You know, that's just my, my feeble uh, attempt at answering the question. I hope it is beneficial. Rizzoli, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I was going to, I'll, since our last webinar, we've been given some resources that churches are actually doing, but I do realize that before you even get to that part, if they're not talking about it at all, they're definitely not going to be willing to do that. And, and then I'm always a little, um, you know, just, I'm not saying reading a book together doesn't make a difference. But reading that book in conversation, not only with your context and people that look like you, inviting other people into that. Um, and so we do, there are some churches that are doing some great things that, that tap into not only um, helping white people feel comfortable with the discomfort of having white privilege, mm -hmm. but also taking action steps to use their power to help make a difference. And I think, and I think that that is what we need to be doing. At, in, as we respond in faith, the question is how can, how can, we're stronger together. We need each other. Dr. Miller said that earlier. And I think um, one of the things that sticks with me is that, that Ubuntu is that, that I am because you are. I mean, Dr. Miller, of course, you know, she's like, I'm a white woman. And what is it that I can, what is it that I can do? Um, and we need more white people to do that. I mean, that's just the reality because she's going to be able to talk to people that you won't be able to talk to. She, people will listen to her that won't listen to you. They, they're not going to be able to even hear you. So, so we all need, we all need each other. We all need each other. Well, and just a couple of quick things. You need a support group around you immediately that gets you where you can erp it all up. As traumatized exactly who you are and, and taking your gifting and moving it even further. So number one, the, or two, two things with that. The third is um, an outside person can come in, but also you can be paired. He can be paired pastorally with somebody. And what is another congregation doing that is innovative that helps him find his voice? Because somewhere he's probably lost his voice in the midst of this too, or how can he find it? And what are specific worship practices that the church is doing that is innovative that you could use an, as an entree point for addressing? Confession. You can emphasize confession. You can move it into the sermon as well. And then you can have a response to that confession and then you can have action steps during the week related to that confession so you could actually take a practice that the church is doing that does it well and you can emphasize it and go further there's a but i can also link you with these wonderful people <laughs> which i'm going to do <laughs> and carmen I'm a, mm -hmm. okay. go ahead i'll I'll talk, I'll, I'll get your information, Carmen, because there was something very powerful said to me today. And, uh, and I want to, I want to, I want to talk about that. Uh, not now, but Dr. Reverend Dr. Miller, one time we need to talk about the bondage. I mean, that bondage of, you know, as, you know, as I can tell you from my perspective, you know, that. 110% is expected from me as a black person. 110% is expected from me. And, and <laughs> that is the demand. And for most people of color, if you mess up a little bit, I mean, you're already black, so you got that going against you. So you ha we have to, 110, 20% is asked of us. And so, um, you know, we, we can determine if, if the inequality that, that happens by demanding that we be perfect in a system that requires perfection from us in exchange for equality, it's unjust. It is unjust. And we will not get there through the norms that we have established and holding up these norms as if these should be the norms. That is breaking and needs to break and we will resist that 
Um, there are several questions here, including from Perry Washington Jr. I saw, but others. Uh, Christian, which one should we take next? All right, um, let's go to Allison Barley Alvarado. Let's, let's see which question she has. Allison, can you, uh, yeah. Am I Hello, there? Allison. Hello. Where are you from? So I live in Irving, Texas and go to church at First United Methodist in Fort Worth. Oh, bless you. Hello, hello. Uh, Tim Brewster. That's right. Okay. Yep, it's uh, and that's it's through those circles that I found the first panel discussion that you all did and I uh, got the link to this one. So thank you so much for doing this. It's been terrific. Um, so my question, uh, and it was it was kind of long winded. So um, it included that phrase that uh, you mentioned earlier about we need to make sure that this is not a moment, but a movement. That's something that I heard over the weekend and that really resonated with me. And so specifically, you know, there's, there's a lot behind that, but what I've been thinking a lot about lately is um, there right now feels different. We've been, we've been here before this time feels does feel different to me. And I'm very encouraged with um, the engagement, the listening, the, the interest that, that people seem to have right now. I, I saw the, uh, uh, New York Times nonfiction uh, bestsellers list this week, the top five are all related to uh, racism or how to be an anti-racist. Um, and, and all five of those books were there last week too, um, kind of in the top 20. So I'm, I'm so encouraged by that. But my, my question is, um, you know, we're, we live in a society that I think is very, um, as I like to say, solution oriented or looking for a fix you know, there's, I see the problem, I understand the problem, now how do we fix it? And I just feel like this is something that we're not going to fix. This is a, this is, this could be a lifelong thing that we're doing here. And so, you know, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are and how we make this, um, how do we build endurance, spiritual endurance and emotional endurance, um, center ourselves in Christ and make sure that, that this is a lifetime commitment, that this is a transformation that we're going towards and not, you know, not a trend or, or a thing that we're, that we're going to solve. So this is a phenomenal question. And one of the works that I, do, I work with and how I work with any time I come to planning anything or working with a group to teach in terms of worship or preaching or spiritual formation is with the scriptures, I will look at an example of an overcomer in the scriptures and say, what is the gift of this, the gifts of this overcomer? What are the muscles, embodied muscles that they're using? How are they posturing themselves? And how is Jesus responding and the community responding for such a time as this? And what can we glean? And what is happening with the overcomers? Already in our conversation, we can say, what are the muscles of overcoming that Christian and Rosolia have already done in this meeting. And we would glean from that and say those practices can actually help us to steward what going forward. So for the woman with the hemorrhage is an overcomer. She's persistent, desperate. Yes. She is um, not going to be stopped. She is ostracized from the community. Um, she is lower than low and she um, has a, some inkling and whatever iota of that of faith in the midst of her bleeding, she is going to reach out to be blessed. I mean, she, she's going to grab a hold of that blessing and, and, it, and even just touch the fringe of it. So a fringe on the fringe of society. So use the scriptures in the context and then over the long haul, connect locally, find organizations, find groups, find clusters, develop ones develop. I know reading clubs get a, too much buzz as far as white people, but I'm going to say that is a great way to go in terms of discussion, but have the discoveries reported back to the church. Always put it right back if it's in the context of the body. I mean, Carmen just gave us an illustration of when people are too quiet, that group needs to come and say, we discovered this and reading this right back in the worship context, a space um, or into community. It needs to be brought back in the community, but long haul movements right in the community context. So when I moved to Charlotte last September, who's doing the work? Where are they going? 
How am I going to be connected? How am I going to help my students be connected? How am I going to make sure the program is connected? How are we going to work with local partners? How are we going to address every piece and offer avenues for that? Those are long haul things. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I see questions from Perry. Christian, can we bring Perry in? I'm working on it right now. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> it's learning, still learning on the fly. <laughs> Thank you all for, for hanging in here with us. We are so glad that you were here. We're trying to get your questions answered if you have any. Um, and I, I ask a question of all people, no matter what color you are, what, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? So we have Mr. Perry Washington on the line. Let's let's uh, on the on the Zoom here. Hi, Perry. Hello, hello. How are you all doing? Hello, Perry. Doing well. Good to meet you. It's great to meet you all as well. This has been great. I've enjoyed myself. Thank you all for hosting this space. It has been a safe space, but a healing one as well. Bless you. Bless you. And I got, and I just wanted to let you know that I, I see your email, and I'm going to answer it as soon as we get off the phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> but, thank you. <laughs> but go ahead and, uh, and let let everybody know where you're from and and who you are, and then uh, just go jump right into the questions that you pose to all of us. Yeah, my name is Perry Washington Jr. and currently I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm the director of youth theology at um, Pfeiffer. University. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm excited to be here uh, and to be in this space. And some of the things that I've been uh, sort of thinking about as we've been in this conversation has been uh, kind of what are some of the ritualistic practices, um, spiritual practices that marginalized communities can engage that facilitates forgiveness, uh, that includes accountability in action. I think a lot of times we think only about forgiveness or that word gets thrown up in the fight for justice, unfortunately. Well, yeah, gets thrown up in the, in the fight for justice, usually as a mechanism of fragility. And so what are the ways in which we can uh, sort of engage practices? I look at protests as a form of ritual as well. Uh, but what are some, some practices that uh, spiritual communities can engage uh, that facilitates these conversations and much needed ones? And secondly, how do we address dis discriminatory practices within the church that sort of engender sexism, homophobia, and transphobia before we go and or as we push for change in the social sphere, sort of addressing sort of the things that we and how we create marginalized communities within our faith spaces prior to or as we're going out to the uh, social sphere demanding change there as well. So uh, practice specific practices, um, ritualistic spiritual practices. These, again, I go and I learn from marginalized communities and connect to more marginalized communities and learn again, and then I connect to dominant communities, so to speak, um, and then teach from there. So several things. One, water and blood. <laughs> we need water and we, water and blood are both deep symbols in the Christian tradition. So use water. When there was a breaking in one of the groups of a race, a racist statement that was stated, we addressed it and we, I used water as part of that and, and even stones in terms of an act of acknowledging the pain of what had been going on and the process of healing and creating that space. But use the water and use it in its dangerous waters and its holy waters and its goodness and its cleansing waters all at the same time. So remembering baptism, but when you remember baptism, put it back together. Offer blessing for going to school in the midst of a dangerous society and reality. When we have our brown and black skin and even going to elementary school, how do we offer a blessing but more than that, how do we offer a blessing that helps them put on the armor of love? I mean, here we have in Ephesians, hey, I'm going to tell you how to believe, belong, and behave, and then I'm going to tell you what you're really up against in, in Ephesians, for example, in, the, in that book. And this is what you put on. And so 
what, how do we teach people to put on some different kind of armor than what the world provides when physically they can even do that? I also do um, a blessing of the senses. It's something that is done in the Roman Catholic tradition for catechumenate, people who are coming into the faith, blessing the ears, the eyes, the nose, the mouth. This helps us, and the, Carmen, this would be a good one in your congregational context too, to bless our senses to be awakened to what is going on around us. Or for forgiveness pieces and pathways for that, somewhere there needs to be an acknowledgement of the pain and an acknowledgement of a pathway of reconciliation with that pain. Don't close it too fast. Keep it open. I come from an Anabaptist background where we tend to do forgiveness too fast and forgive and forget is Shakespeare. It is not in the scriptures as Perry knows really, really well already. Um, <laughs> you said, you said acknowledgement of pain and a pathway of. An acknowledgement of pain and a pathway in which to engage that pain in a safe space. So you're going to create the container not to tap it down, but to hold the space for the pain to be allowed to come forth and to acknowledge and provide tools for people to receive that pain. And so the tools are, how do you create that safe space? How do you orient people not to react, but be listeners? How do you acknowledge that? So that work needs to happen and it can happen fairly quickly, actually in certain communities. And other communities, it's going to take a long period of time. The other is any housed backed baggage that a congregation has that it's hidden. It's all there. All of it. All of it's incarnate and in the room. We just pretend it's not. And that's going to come up even as we deal with racism and all of the other realities, that's going to start to come up. And so being able to have that come forth. The other spiritual practices is, is a table practice. Um, I was just going to uh, send us out with a table uh, prayer when we uh, conclude, but, um, and it's from, it's a pledge of love from the early Anabaptist tradition and that we're actually asked to pledge love to one another and how we come to table with one another. The other is who's allowed to serve and be served and cook food for one another. Upend some of the patterns of who's allowed where and who's not allowed at the table and confess who's not allowed at the table, then expand the table and invite somebody very different to the table. Those are also spiritual practices or be at different tables and come back to the table. The other, these are learned from communities at the border. Um, these are incarnational practices. I'm just going to list them. Um, Perry one do pilgrim walks in our own communities and beyond, pilgrimages change us, but pilgrimages where we see suffering and how people are engaging that. Welcome the stranger. This is a practice, specific practices of welcoming the stranger, joining one another, name, bless and resound what is happening in order to remember. So don't allow forgetting, forgiving, forgetting to pretend that it doesn't exist. Enact a different story. This is the biggest one. Stories make sense of our lives and our experiences. That's how we make sense and are wired. Enact a different story. Provide space that it's a different story is enacted. I mean, the fact that we even have this life story of an incarnate God among us is that's a different story. Call to the prayers of the people, who, where, how, and what we pray for matters. Call to notice our posture, our stance towards. Call to stand. Have people stand to join in standing in protest. That is a simple act. Have people turn away physically. Physically have people enter in. Called for permeable boundaries in rituals, who's in, who's out, but then extend those permeable boundaries and move not only as if, but as is in the realm of the kingdom of God. Um, that how do we, that, that we are now community 
And we are operating as if and as a community right now. We are enacting something in resistance. Um, so those are just some, some core pieces. But also I talked about the breath prayer last time, Resolvia lettuce, but also leading in a breath prayer where our bodies become the fulcrum of peace as God's body in the world. Um, to notice that and over and over again, breathe a different pattern. And the discriminatory practices, uh, that is huge. It's systemic, it's daily, and it, we even are going to need to look at, um, depending on our tradition and our church context, a different kind of lectionary. What's missing? Juneteenth isn't in it. I mean, what is, what is missing in our context? <clears throat> and there is an African-American lectionary, but we're going to need to include more stories in that circular context and release that. The other is, you want to talk about trans? If we're talking about transformation, I'm going to say something that's going to sound really <laughs> out there. <laughs> if you want people who, in their own bodies, are encountering change, I think we're going to need to listen over and over to people that are trans to say, what's your story and how did you know to change? And if we're called to change as the body of Christ, even if we disagree, might people who are trans actually have some tools for us that could help the church? Now that may sound really far out wow. there, but a change wow. in our formation there actually may be in this is in a body of somebody who is encountering extraordinary pain and we got to listen whether we agree or disagree that's that's even not the point <laughs> and and that's where it misses the point so there i, I want to just start there when i started with listening I, I was very serious of how do we learn how to change in our transformation by people who are having to change that they know in their bodies. And why is that? And that's a foreign land to me. Right. I have a lot to learn and a lot I don't understand. But you talk to a parent of somebody who's trans who really gets their pain, very different. That's, that's so powerful. That is, that is powerful. <laughs> that Perry, is very Perry, powerful. Perry, did you have anything else or? No, no, <laughs> that was powerful. <laughs> All right. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for raising the question, um, uh, Perry. And uh, yeah, but once again, Dr. Miller, you are a gem in the crown of the kingdom. Thank you very much for that. I mean, because it, it it really shakes the foundation of the church when we have to extend past the the superficial walls that we've created to to hold the church in and to keep others out. So that recommendation of of uh, of leaning on the wisdom of our transgender sisters and brothers who who have gone through the transformation um through all the chaos and whatnot that's 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 very powerful and at saint luke um community united methodist church in dallas my my home church um we do engage in that uh in the annual the uh the the on the academic calendar spring and fall anointing not only our students um, but the teachers as well, teachers and, and nurses and anyone who works in school to give them a prophetic covering and, and to call and to invoke in the Holy Spirit to work with them, to walk with them as they travel um, a life's journey during the school year. Um, I've seen it also used in other churches where um, the pastor would raise the question, what sins have we committed rel relative to a specific topic? And they write out in each of the congregants, write out um, uh, whatever sin they have and they pin it to the cross and then they they go through the process of realizing that we need to stop pinning Christ to the cross he came down <laughs> he, he he rose again <laughs> but our racism our, our phobias our issues keep nailing Christ back to the cross and and that's a really well really real way in which we can see how our issues are keeping Christ permanently fixed it permanently uh, uh, fixed to the cross. So yeah, powerful, powerful. I also have a series of uh, Lexio Divina. It's a divine reading of Scripture and how you read that, and moving from how you read 
to then how might you do Lexio in a prayer walk in your own neighborhood? And then how might you do an Alexio that is a liberating Lexio of how we engage scripture in community? And all three are a, pro a co progressive and all spiritual progressive practices and all spiritual practices that are very central, but root us in our context over and over again and Christ and one another. Well, uh, we have Gina Hahn. Uh, please welcome. Hello, to Gina. Hi, Gina. Hi, Gina. Tell us who you are. Introduce yourself. Tell us where you're from. Okay. Um, I am in Little Egypt or Little Elm, as I, I like to call it, Little Egypt, because it's like so far from Dallas. Um, but I am uh, a friend of Christian's. Uh, and uh, we went to Perkins together. And so I just recently graduated. I have my MDiv, my home church, yay. <laughs> um, my home church is in Dallas itself. So um, at Oakland United Methodist Church, I'll give a shout out to them. Um, so my question is, and I think Allison touched on this a little bit. And, you know, as we're in this space of learning and listening, Listening, let me put it this way, listening and then learning, you know. Um, I, I have this, um, I love missions and outreach. Um, uh, and that's one of the things that I'm really drawn to along with social justice. Um, within the church and taking that out into the street, bringing it into the church and then bringing it back out into the street. Um, but one of the things that I have encountered and have actually had to grow out of myself is the, and I hate this word. I, I'm, I'm really uh, hesitant to even use this word, but um, the white sa savior mentality. First, the definition of it. Um, but Allison had mentioned, you know, I think she, and if I've misquoted her, I, I apologize. But she said about the, the, we're in this space right now where we want um, to fix and have a solution. And I think Dr. Miller, you mentioned that this is not a fix and solution. This is a lifelong journey. Um, and it's a journey that I have been on for many, many years myself, but um, I'm still like, I'm, this last month has just been hugely eye-opening to even myself um, as a white um, LGBTQ person. Um, that serves in the church. So what I don't want to see and how can we prevent this? Because what I'm seeing in the context is the church is opening up its doors to provide like book studies and Bible studies and, and, and providing space for learning and listening and then wanting to go out and become advocates for, you know, to eradicate systemic r racism and, and talk about individual racism and the biases that we have and the discrimination. But then there's that shift of that fix and solution, how we can prevent the white savior mentality to come into play. Um, the, you know, taking pictures on mission trips, you know, and, and doing, doing, oh, look what we're doing. And it's like, you want to lift up what the church is doing, but you don't want it to be focused on yourself. Am I making myself clear on that question? And how can we tell people or show them or, or minister to them and saying in the congregation that we can't, this is not a, a quick fix. This is not going in and, and working at Austin Street Shelter for a weekend. This is long. -term. Right. So this is not a for, it's a with. And that is uh, deeply biblical in terms of Christ who comes with Emmanuel with us, speaking of incarnation. And so anytime your posture is going to be for, not with, mm -hmm. that's a clue that you're moving or the congregation is, have it be a litmus test, have it be a question um, that anything we engage, are we with, or are we doing it for? Mm -hmm. So that's a question. How are we lifting up with, not for, um, over and over again? And if we're finding we're in the four category a lot, why is that? And what do we need to divest of in order to shift the categories? 
Um, because th this is a really good litmus test of, of asking ourselves the question, because it's going to raise something about how food operates in our society, the haves, the haves not, have not, how, how regulations have happen, and how there's some incredible resources for this. But again, with not for, and I think we have done a poor job uh, as professors of helping people know how to equip laity. Mm. I mean, I'm just going to be straight up. We've done a poor job of equipping laity and entrusting laity to be bright, articulate, and, and, and not dumbed down. Um, and, and to raise up empowering laity. And I think the movement of theological education is going to be right in the heart of congregations along with educations we're going to need to get out of our silos. So again, this is a problem of academia. We've been in our ivory towers. Mm -hmm. So we have been four people as well. And so we are, we are part of the problem. And so in entering into this, again, ask the over and over, it's with, not for, which means how do I learn to interview my own neighbors? How do I learn to listen to my own neighbors? And starting with a discovery process of our neighbors is pretty amazing. And say, what do you think of God? I believe that everybody has a kind of faith. And just learning mm. and being a learner of our neighbors and at the feet of our neighbors as part of this. So an example, um, there's Haywood Street in Asheville, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you may have heard of that context mm -hmm. and what Haywood Street is working with. And that's particular to their context, but they thought, well, how do we serve homeless people? So let's hire somebody. Let's get a committee and hire somebody. Well, what they ended up working with is the person that they hired said, no, I'm going to go live among the people and ask what it is. Get to know people as friends. And it changes the shape of that. Um, the, other the other book, um, mm -mm -mm, it is called Renegade um, Christianity or Renegade Church. Yes. It's a really good one. How a church discovered its values and it's in um, and the values it wasn't and how they got co-opted and its posture. And when they found that their core mission as a church and who they were and how where they drifted from that and how they shifted back to this with how it was moving towards a four and then being particular in that and, and the mess and, and acknowledging that, that's very helpful. So it's decolonizing that. It's continually aiming for a decolonizing behavior. So me, I'm decolonizing my bookshelves. I'm asking how can I uplift people and come in a very different way. Um, but speaking of the bodily weight of truth, sometimes and this isn't a savior complex. This is very different. This is physically and even face on Facebook. How can I bodily put myself in the way of of my sister and brother becoming the target and that's doing the wounding. Sometimes it may require that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not a savior mentality. It's different. It's saying I have the ability, power is the ability to, so what am I going to do with my ability to, and how am I going to use it with? So just some ideas. No, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. So appreciate y'all. Yeah. Thank you for the neighboring movement and good neighbor movement. There are some excellent resources on there and uh, I would highly recommend the resources on there. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard of them. So um, definitely. And I appreciate the, the book recommendation too. So um, because I know that we can, you know, I've seen it even with myself, I, I'll put myself out there. I've, I've gone from the width to the four and back to the width. And, uh, and I know that, that it's, it is going to be a lifelong journey, but I don't, I'm, I'm concerned for my faith community. I don't want them to fall into that trap rather in this process of 
Yeah. I also think the act of um, working with spiritual formation, spiritual direction in a congregational setting and training more people from right within the congregation that really can work at the painful spiritual realities going on is really helpful to actually help um, till the soil for the ground that needs to happen to address the sin of racism. Yeah. You're awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. And good talk. Good to hearing your voice. Love Bye, you, Gina. <laughs> Bye. All right. Well, um, I don't think that there were any other questions, so I guess we're at the point of final comments and benediction, final comments, next steps, and benediction. How about that? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Dr. I Miller? yield my time to... <laughs> So um, I, have, <laughs> I have a table prayer I'd like to send us out with. And this table prayer is part of the tradition where I've been clergy and in the Mennonite tradition. Um, and I've said before, I'm kind of Methanite in many ways um, since I've connected with Methodists and taught Methodists so much of my career and attend a Methodist church. Um, um, but I also... Um, want to share with you this pledge of love that was adapted um, a worship resource we've also done a new hymnal in the Mennonite Church USA in Canada and was part of the worship resources but also this is um, a beautiful pledge of love of coming to the table by an early Anabaptist in the 1500s and uh, Anabaptism have its roots out of the Protestant movement, but sometimes doesn't call it to self Protestant, even though Protestants were based in protest. By the way, my husband, just an illustration of a practice, did a children's story on Martin Luther, who protested and he stood and he stood up in the children's sermon and he said, I can, um, I, I'm protesting, I'm standing and I can do no other. And he talked about how Methodism has its roots in Protestantism in protest. So notice how a white pastor in a white congregation is actually assisting through a children's story of bridging the gap right in our history to say we are built on protest. But anyway, that's a separate, I digress, but it's a specific practice. The Pledge of Love. So I offer this Pledge of Love, and if you wish, you can respond when I uh, extend my hands to you, and I'll just say it as well in case you can't see me. Um, and your response, if you wish, will be, by the grace of God, I will. So say that with me. By the grace of God, I will. That is your response. Friends. Whoever desires to eat the bread and drink the cup, let us respond with the pledge of love. We are called to love God before all things in the power of God's living word and join ourselves to God's way. And together, by the grace of God, I will. We are called to love and serve our neighbors and lay down our lives in the power of Jesus Christ who laid his life down for us. Together, by the grace of God, I will. We are called to practice mutual admonition, to speak and to hear the truth, to cease what harms our neighbors and do good to our enemies. Together, by the grace uh, of God, I will. I will. May the Spirit of God, who calls the church to Christ's supper and the tables in this world, give us the grace, strength, and patience to live this pledge of love. And all God's people said, Amen. And Rosalia, we have got to hear your singing voice to send us out, and your grandma song it's an inner hymnal but to hear you sing it that strengthens us with the muscles we need and i think people need on this call to be sent out on would you please walk with me lord walk with me walk with me lord Walk with me while I'm on the hill 
pilgrim journey. I want Jesus to walk with me. Hold my hand, Lord. Hold my hand. Hold my hand, Lord. Hold my hand. While I'm on this pilgrim journey, I want Jesus to walk with me. walk with us as we leave this place but never <laughs> the presence of God thank you thank you Reverend Dr. Miller thank you Minister Christian thank you to all the participants that are here we hope to see you all next Monday six o'clock central standard time seven o'clock eastern standard time while we continue to discuss systemic racism, advocacy, spiritual formations, and how we respond as people of faith, living faithfully. This is the General Board of Church and Society's little tagline, and it's living faithfully, seeking justice, and pursuing peace. We want to continue to do this. And this is not a moment, it's a movement. Thank you. Thank you all. You. Thank you so, Reverend Dr. Miller, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, you bless our spirits. Whew. And for those who are still online, don't forget to go to umcjustice.org to see how you can be, see how you can participate in the advocacy of, of justice um, from, from your own living room. There's easy ways to uh, uh, pursue justice and to advocate um, for policies to dismantle um, uh, racism and uh, uh, a lot of the manifestations of it in our uh, in, from the federal level. So please go to that website, look for the advocacy asks, and then also sign up for the newsletters and whatnot so that you can uh, get those if, get those alerts on a regular basis. All right, bye y'all. Thanks for joining. Thank you all. Thank you guys.